Welcome students. Today we're going to be discussing brand cancer, an insidious illness that often goes undiagnosed until it's much too late. We'll be looking at a case study with Disney to show how symptoms can often be diagnosed as a short-term problem when they are actually much more serious. Now 2023 was an absolutely abysmal year for the Disney company. By now you've likely heard that they lost over a billion dollars at the box office between their various studios. It's very bad, but maybe not in the way that you're thinking. Disney is a massive company and they can, believe it or not, shrug off a billion dollars in losses. But the box office performance is only one symptom of a serious brand cancer that is racking the entire company. Let's go over the tests and x-rays to show the symptoms, the damage, the cause, and then I can recommend treatment. Thanks, Doc. We'll get back to him in a bit. Now, you are not surprised by the news that Disney is deeply troubled right now. But it's not just box office losses this year or the last couple of years. It's much, much deeper than that. See, Disney as a brand is severely damaged. And even if they take drastic steps to fix things this year, some damage has already been done and it will take years to fully resolve. Dr. Greg said they can shrug off a billion dollar box office loss. How can that be? Well, at the end of the 2023 calendar year, Disney's current valuation is about $165 billion. It's such a big company, you guys. They employ over 200,000 people around the world, and each year they generate over $80 billion in revenue. The last couple of years, they've recorded gross profits over $20 billion, and net profits after deductible expenses and such around $3 billion. Those box office bombs are absorbed as an operating expense thanks to your government. Don't trust your government, kids. So while having a terrible movie year and losing a billion at the box office is not nothing, it's also not the bankruptcy-inducing horror that a smaller company might face. And it's also not the first time. 2020 was a much worse year for the company because the pandemic affected the parks, which are the mouse's real moneymaker. While they did have to borrow $40 billion just to cover operating costs, they make enough to dig themselves out of something like that, so long as people come back to the parks. At the end of 2023, they were already digging out, currently down to $46 billion from a peak at $54 billion. If this were HGTV, I'd tell you that this company has good bones, with a lot of potential. Is there... Is there like a, a corporate version of shiplap? Because they, they just need that. Something else with a lot of potential is the channel that you're watching, and its health can be improved by you hitting the like button. You know, nine out of 10 YouTubers recommend hitting the like button, which is a number that lends authority to me suggesting it. But this is a future problem for Disney. The massive revenues they are now experiencing are only the result of decades of building up the brand. Years and years of excellent family movies they could build attractions and hotels around. Massive amounts of effort going into shaping a public image that welcomed families. Accumulating studios and IPs to bring in new audiences and create whole cinematic universes around. Now you might not be a big fan of modern day Bob Iger, but you cannot keep a straight face while calling him a bad businessman. The juggernaut that Disney is today is a direct result of Iger's leadership for 15 years, building momentum that eventually paid off massively. Until it didn't. Unfortunately, even the best at business can be caught off guard by social politics, and Iger has been complicit in the company's defeat in this arena. If you're watching me, Chances are high you aren't a big fan of the Star Wars sequel trilogy or the general direction Lucasfilm has been going since their sale to Disney and promotion of Kathleen Kennedy as president. While the trilogy would gross over $4 billion, each new movie fell off more and more, tarnishing the Star Wars name. The fans tried to warn them. Told you so, told you so, told you, told you, told you so. I know this has been a lot of numbers, a little dry, but what I want you to take away from this section is that Disney is facing a serious long-term survivability problem, and it's not because of a bad year. They wrote out COVID just fine. Debts can be paid off. Bad years can be made up. What they are doing right now is laying a weak foundation for the future with Gen Z and Gen Alpha. I've got the test results here, and I'll be honest, it's not optimistic. Looking at the levels of consumer trust is especially telling. When we see new shows not attracting curiosity, otherwise mediocre movies being treated like they are flaming piles of excrement, and a lack of interest in the theme parks and new attractions, well, it paints a grim picture of a customer base that doesn't trust the company anymore. Where fans used to turn out for any movie, we're seeing apathy. Where new attractions we book solid, we see vacancy. If I could liken this to a diet, 
I think you're well aware that it's not enough to avoid unhealthy foods, but your body also needs nutrient-dense, healthful foods in order to perform its best. Sadly, the customer body hasn't seen a truly quality product in several years, and has been force-fed a large quantity of what is essentially fast food entertainment, which would explain this lack of trust and loyalty. To right, doctor. I mentioned before that there are visible cracks in Disney's foundation, and a big part of that foundation is customer trust. Let's take a look at some of the ways last year that consumers let the Disney company know that they trust them about as much as they trust a fart after Taco Tuesday. First up, let's look at some show viewer numbers. Their first big flop of the year was Secret Invasion. In its first five days, Samba TV reported that just shy of a million homes streamed Nick Fury's boring solo adventure. At that time, the only MCU show it beat for the time period was Ms. Marvel. View numbers dropped as the season went on, and with good reason. It was terrible and went out of its way to demean the former leader of S.H.I.E.L.D. What's telling about the number of initial views is how excited people are for any product. Nobody knows if a show is going to be good or bad until they watch it, but that's if they even want to watch it. The trailer said this was a spy thriller starring Nick Fury. How could you not want to watch that? Well, obviously, for many people, they just stopped caring about the brand in general. Ahsoka also debuted to lower than average ratings with 1.2 million households tuning in for the first week. Now that's low for Star Wars compared to the 1.9 million Book of Boba Fett got or the 2.1 million for Obi-Wan. Once again, this shows that people don't hate Ahsoka. They hadn't even seen it. They don't trust the brand. After terrible products like Book of Fett and Mandalorian Season 3, the trust was gone, and few people felt the need to tune in to another Lucasfilm snooze fest. That show proved people right, too. While I did enjoy the first two episodes looping in normies like me, the pace never picked up, and when the finale came around... they lost 30% of the viewers. A glimmer of hope is to be found in Loki season two, however, which also started out pretty slow, bringing in almost 40% fewer viewers than season one. Again, showing the overall lack of trust and interest in the brand. However, those viewers were consistent throughout the season and the finale actually got more views than the first episode, owing to good word of mouth, which I can attest to. There are some areas that I don't think were perfect, but overall, it was a well done season and very satisfying ending for the redeemed villain. This should also show Disney that the audience will show up for quality. There is this stereotype of the angry fanboy that likes to hate everything, but when the show is quality, they are happy to show up. I don't hate you. I don't hate you too. Away from Disney Plus, there is more bad news. Park attendance was pretty dismal this summer. Last year saw a huge surge of park visits as folks were engaging in revenge travel and making up for lost time from the response to the pandemic. But now that wad has been shot and the pendulum is swinging back a bit. Here you can see wait times from July 4 of last year. They are half of what they were in previous years. Partly this is due to higher park prices, partly it's due to rising costs in general and smaller disposable incomes, and partly it's due to a lack of new generation customers, resulting from years of poor movie products. One very concrete example is the closure of the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser in Orlando. Now it was pretty funny to watch this massive thing fall apart in less than a year, but it speaks to a much larger issue that Disney will be facing more and more over the next few years. People generally don't like their new crap. That hotel was a two-day interactive dinner theater style thing where you stayed on property and employees in cosplay came around to interact with you and the bad guys were hunting for a rebel during the trip. Sounds pretty cool. The thing is, it was all designed around the sequel trilogy. It was First Order troops looking for a rebel. Of the three trilogies, the sequel is the least liked. So nobody wanted to show up and live two days immersed in the crappy movies. If they had made it OG Star Wars and you could go hang out in the Moss Eisley Cantina or something, that would have attracted an army of fans. Hell yeah, bro! Hell yeah! Banana bread, bro! But since the sequel trilogy was a Disney creation, they arrogantly pushed forward with that one. It's just the first symptom of future problems. Remember, the entertainment side doesn't actually make the company much money, but the movies do actually affect the profitability of the company just indirectly through merchandising, licensing, general brand interest, and park visits. That's why the string of losses these last few years are such a big deal. It's the lack of opportunity that is really killing them.
They can't build attractions or sell merch with this new garbage. One of my kids is still obsessed with Stitch and will buy Stitch stuff. Kids are still, to this day, requesting cars and Nemo-themed birthday parties. Little girls are out there right now pining for a shirt with Belle or Jasmine on it, and their parents were in kindergarten when that came out. That stuff is classic. You think a kid's gonna want a turning red or soul-themed birthday party? No. Do kids want shirts and hoodies with Luca on them? No, man. Are kids gonna want plushies of the little slime blob from Strange World or the star from Wish? Shit, no, man. Just like families didn't want to visit a Star Wars attraction based on the least liked part of the IP, Disney can't build attractions based off of this schlock. There isn't going to be a ride based on Onward. No kids want to meet and greet those characters at the park. No, hard pass. Speaking of Wish, it did horribly, speaking to that audience lack of trust, but it's the cracks under the surface that are most telling. Have you seen the way people are talking about this movie? They are crapping all over it like it actively came out of the screen and pissed in their popcorn. Now, I cannot honestly defend the movie, but I also think the complaints are vastly overblown. I didn't love it, but I still enjoyed myself while I was at the theater. It was extremely okay. It was a solid 6 out of 10. But people talked about it like it was a literal dumpster fire, and that tells you how people are feeling about the company these days. Even as short a time ago as 2021 with Raya and the Last Dragon, people still had hope in the company, and even though Raya is super mid, everyone kind of enjoyed themselves and then moved on. There ain't no company's perfect, right? Same for Frozen 2, two years earlier. That movie was worse than Wish, if you ask me, but again, we all kind of shrugged and said, eh, it's mid, but eh, whatever. Now, public emotion toward the company, public trust that the company can deliver is gone, and we are not giving them the benefit of the doubt. So, a middling movie like Wish that I guarantee would have gotten a disappointed shrug five years ago is now a steaming pile of crap in the audience's eyes. Disney should be worried about the response to that movie, not because it didn't make money, but because it's building the momentum narrative that Disney is the worst company on the earth. The worst. Another sign of Disney's negative momentum is the stock price. During the month of January, the stock has been hovering around $90 per share, about $95, which is the same level it was trading at 10 years ago. In fact, $90 was the dip in otherwise higher trading during those years. Now, $90, $95 seems to be the high point with the stock spending the second half of 2023 in the mid to low 80s, sometimes dipping into the 70s. You can see it peaked here at the beginning of 21, and you don't need to be a technical analysis nerd to see the obvious downward trend for the last three years. The price jumped in late November after earnings and is, once again, drifting downward. The reason the stock means anything to us is that it signals what investors see in the future for this company. You, know, you want to buy low, sell high, right? But you have to be expecting high prices at some point in the future in order to be buying. And this chart clearly shows no buying pressure, indicating a lack of confidence from investors. If you have a curiosity about business and investing and how ultra wealthy people look at things, you really might like this all in podcast. It's three billionaires and an almost billionaire just chatting about business stuff. Now recently they were doing a year end wrap up and two of the guys listed Disney as the biggest loser of the year. A third wanted to say Disney, but he figured he'd say something else since the point had already been made. And these guys aren't just citing the bad box office. They're not just looking at one bad year. They're looking forward and they are not liking what they see. They're citing the DEI policies that are clearly bad for business. And every day, more and more investors are seeing the writing on the wall that DEI is not the win for profit and productivity that was promised. Future, how do you feel about this company? She belongs to the streets. Can't argue with that. And what news would make investors feel good about buying anyway? They know Disney had to buy Hulu for $9 billion at the end of the year, and that only got them the remaining third of the company. They know Disney Plus is still losing money, but hey, not as much as it used to. Oh yeah, I used to suck, but not anymore. They know subscriber growth is stagnant and revenue per sub is half what Netflix has. They can see the aforementioned lack of consumer trust. They can see the massive debt to income ratios. None of this looks great. And being so huge, Disney is a slow moving company. So these folks aren't anticipating a big move upward in price 
anytime soon. Well, we've gone over the symptoms and the test results, but before we can offer a solution, I think it's important that we look at the causes first, and there are many. Knowing what healthy activities to engage in is good and all, but it's important that we recognize those unhealthy habits to avoid as well. From the looks of the recent library, I'm seeing a lot of empty calorie content. As I said, this is basically fast food, and it might be fine in small amounts, but they're going to have to cut back. They're also skipping meal prep, choosing quick pre-made items that aren't as nutritious. That's correct, Dr. Greg. Disney has been pumping out content fast food, pre-made garbage content devoid of anything that really satisfies and coated with a sweet virtue signal glaze. Whew, okay, I'm kind of making myself a little hungry. I'm going to switch away from the food metaphors now. In short, the company got lazy. They took the wrong lesson from some of those billion dollar blockbusters and attempted to mass produce them. 2022 and 23 demonstrated just how bad things have gotten for them with $200 million budgets and massive marketing campaigns being the standard now with some movies approaching the 300 million mark. That's the sort of budgeting habit you get into when you are really certain your movie is going to bust through a billion with no problem. And when it's something like Infinity War or Endgame, where you've been creating a decade-long hype cycle and you're going to deliver this climactic finale, well, you can pretty much bank on that. When it's a movie starring one character the audience isn't overly fond of and two others that they don't even know unless they're rabid Disney Plus watchers, well, it's a little less certain and maybe you shouldn't sink almost $300 million into something like that. <laughs> But I don't just want to pick on Marvel, even though we found out that She-Hulk cost over $200 million, and so did Secret Invasion and both shows were horrendous. All of Disney is having this issue. Indiana Jones 5 cost over $300 million and yielded terrible results, which somehow cost $200 million and will not be turning a profit. Elemental was $200 million and after a slow start, picked up a little steam and then barely crossed the profitability threshold. The company really thought they could manufacture blockbuster after blockbuster forever. That's just plain greedy. The result of their billion dollar addiction is movies that have writing so hackneyed and horrible it's an insult to real writers to call it writing. And yes, some of this writing is so terrible because of the performative diversity ideas that are plaguing Disney at present. I was mentioning in one video that the Marvels had very little of what we might call woke content. No overt weird political lines like We know everything, thanks. And you know nothing. It's a shame you're not a woman anymore. She'd have understood. Something a male presenting Time Lord will never understand. Monica isn't walking down the street and some random guy with a southern accent says she can't be a hero because she's a black woman and then Monica punches him and a bus is passing by and everyone on the bus starts clapping. Nothing like that. Now, there is speculation that those scenes were written in film, just left on the cutting room floor, but the fact is they are not present in the theatrical version. I had an interesting comment saying that even though the movie doesn't contain explicit ideology, this commenter still considers the movie to be woke because it's made by woke people. The comment is right here, but the gist of it is that social progressives are almost exclusively running the show at Disney, and their worldview shapes the scripts and seeps into the writing. It's an interesting concept, and I'm very interested to hear your thoughts on it. Now, I see where this person is coming from, but whenever I'm doing reviews, I usually don't bring up these subtle things because it sounds like I'm reaching, but you can see some evidence even when it's not blatant. Some small credit to Star Wars acolyte writer Leslie Headland, she was at least honest that her queerness will be reflected in the show. For an example of how this works, I always go back to She-Hulk. Writer Jessica Gao sees all men as general villains, so she thinks everyone else sees them that way as well. The show just assumes you agree men in positions of power are bad, so it never really shows you how they are so awful, with the exception of Dennis, who tells her to smile more and refers to a woman as it. He doesn't work because he is a full-on parody caricature. Beyond that, it's clear that the show is just written in a world where men are sleazy and untrustworthy and kind of dumb, and they're holding women like Jen back. I mean, you can always count on me to throw myself under the bus. That's why Holloway pays me the 
medium bucks. Holloway could never have gone through that. He's never had to prove his value to a parade of underwhelming men, <laughs> <laughs> right? It's not well written because most of this is never explained or even shown. Another example is the Barbie movie, where writer Greta Gerwig is already 100% convinced that the patriarchy is so real and so commonly agreed upon that she doesn't need to show it in any way whatsoever. The one time it attempts this with the all-male Mattel board, it was lying. The movie wants you to side with the Barbies, but never gives you a reason, mostly because Gerwig assumes that it's just so obvious. Another way this manifests in Disney as a company is that they are no longer as family-friendly as they used to be. Sometime in the last decade or so, the company realized that the nuclear family is eh, kind of expensive to cater to, and they typically don't have as much money as dinks. If you've never heard the term, that's dual income, no kids. Dinks that love Disney are sometimes derisively referred to as Disney adults by sad, humorless stains on humanity that don't know how to just be happy for other people who are enjoying a hobby. If you're one of these people that's mad at other adults for enjoying Disney alone, I would like to take this opportunity to formally invite you to get back in your lane. Taylor, could you tell him? You need to calm down. That's right. You need to take several seats. The issue though for Disney is that they have leaned in a little hard on catering to those dinks. Now I understand they are profitable, but only in the short term. Disney is becoming less and less appealing for the average nuclear family and even less so for larger families such as mine. I have six children, so I usually need to get like two adjoining rooms and reservations are just more difficult all around. And don't feel bad for me. I love everything about it. I knew what I was getting into, but there are complications. The real victims here are the three kid families. Once you cross that border from four people to five, your travel and dining options dwindle fast. Let's look back at that Galactic Star Cruiser that is no more. The huge majority of these rooms were four person tickets. So you have to be a couple with two kids who both love Star Wars, or you need to have another couple who also love Star Wars and have five grand laying around for this adventure. The customer base just wasn't enormous. Wouldn't it be wonderful if interfaith families could find a way to truly capture the spirit of Chrismica? You get the best of both worlds with the Hanukkah tree topper. Disney has been increasing park prices steadily and also food and merchandise prices. It's becoming cost prohibitive for families, but not for dinks. They can afford things like $100 money shot mini ears. Two years ago, a report came out that almost 20% of families going to Disney do so by taking out some debt. Since then, prices have only risen, consumer debt has grown more, and rates for borrowing have more than doubled. Something else that is more than doubled is food prices. I can assure you that is the truth. And rent and mortgage prices are going up, but wages are not rising at the same rate. What are families going to cut first? A pure luxury business like Disney. Last year, it was reported that more Americans are dipping into retirement accounts for emergency expenses or even day-to-day -day expenses as general inflation continues to plague them. Interest rates are also up. Currently, mortgage rates are above 7%, with personal loans being even higher. With more difficulty in borrowing and less disposable income to go around, it's no wonder Disney park attendance is down and Disney Plus subs are slowing drastically. As I said, this is a future problem. The reason they're so popular right now is because of everything they have done since 1990. Those Disney adults that love to go to the park and spend all their extra cash, they only love the company because they grew up on it. As we've already stated, kids living right now in the present day will not have classics to look back on. Wish, while I again believe it to be watchable, is not the movie that will be watched again and again like Hercules or Emperor's New Groove. Also, the dinks the company loves so much might not even have children to hook on Disney products. And none of this takes into account the parents at present who are pulling away from Disney because they're leaning into content the parents don't agree with. And I'm not even talking about shorts like Out, about a gay man looking for acceptance from his parents. I'm talking about the shows where the parents are bumbling, witless morons whose children are constantly running circles around them. While everybody is focused on Coco Melon having a boy dancing in a dress for his two dads, the real insidious bits of modern children's television is making their parents look stupid, out of touch, and unreliable. As a parent, 
why would I pay a company to show that to my children? Um, so for that reason, I'm out. But back to the gay content, parents also don't like that or any sexual content at all. Disney used to be recognized as a family company that parents could trust, but now parents need to screen everything in case not so subtle messages are slipped in. And this isn't some crazy conspiracy. You might recall executive producer Latoya Raveno bragging two years ago about how she was just basically adding queerness to like, the, if you see anything queer in the show, I'm proud of But like, I, I just was like, no one would stop me. She said she was nervous to put it in at first, but received no pushback. Meredith Roberts and like the, the our leadership over there has been so welcoming to like my like not at all secret gay agenda. The thing is, parents are kind of lazy and we don't really want to filter every show to see if some random adult is trying to slip in queer characters because it makes them happy. So more and more, parents are just abandoning Disney rather than having to do the work of vetting their content. The company has lost sight of its goals and is now all over the map. What used to be family entertainment is now a hodgepodge of whatever content they're experimenting with this month. Marvel now includes Echo and Deadpool, both very mature content. Now, as funny as I found Deadpool, I can admit it has no place in the Disney Marvel lineup. Neither does Echo. It's like Disney doesn't know what to do. They saw Amazon had success with The Boys and Invincible, and they thought, hey, we should try that too. Nope, that's not your lane, and that's okay. You shouldn't have included characters having sex in The Eternals. Now, on the other side of the coin is the recent movie Wish. As I said, it's not the worst movie you've ever seen, but it is also not family entertainment. It would have been right at home as a Disney Junior special, but had no business being in theaters as a Disney family movie. This is Elena of Avalor and Sophia the First level stuff, just with better music and voice actors. In short, Disney is just no longer pro-family. Many of their employees seem to despise the nuclear family unit. They see the entertainment division as a vehicle for social politics, and they don't have the focus to stay with their brand. Well, I hope this has been informative about the dangers of corporate bad habits and the damage they can cause if left unchecked. And it should be beneficial in diagnosing these under the surface problems and not writing them off as short term issues. Now, I wish I had a solution that was as easy as a pill or a small tweak for a quick fix. But I'm afraid the disease has already spread and now the treatment has to be severe. I also don't like to lie. Therapy for a problem like this can take years before the patient sees full recovery. Obviously, I recommend immediately getting away from the unhealthy content, such as these upcoming Captain America and Snow White movies. Simply changing a few ingredients won't help. The entire pantry needs to be cleaned out of this kind of stuff and the patient might need to start over. That can be difficult because our minds don't want to let go of the sunk costs. The patient needs a whole new relationship with the audience and its own employees, and that is going to be extremely difficult. Once again, the doctor knows what is best. Disney has some hard choices to make going forward and some serious challenges to overcome. There are three really big ones. The first is that they have a lot of garbage in the pipeline. Dr. Greg mentioned Snow White and Captain America 4, both of which are being delayed for reworking, but that's not going to help. We already have DC as an example of what happens when you try to dump the non-functioning projects into theaters, trying to make this slow transition to a new product. Disney should not repeat the mistakes of The Flash, Blue Beetle, and Aquaman 2. They need to eat the cost of these failed projects and start over. The second issue they will face is regaining the public trust. Sadly, they will have to put out multiple really good products in a row to convince disaffected viewers that this company is worth returning to. One success could be a fluke, so it will take a few to really get their status back as a premier studio. This also might need to involve some PR tours and several helpings of Humble Pie for CEO Bob Iger. If they want to earn the trust of the audience back, they might need to apologize. If not required, I do think it would speed up the recovery process. The final hurdle is the most difficult, and that is changing the company culture. Recall that producer saying that she was afraid the higher ups would balk at her inclusion of queerness, but was pleasantly surprised there was no resistance. That producer wasn't really the problem, only a symptom. An environment where children and family programming has LGBT Easter eggs being okayed is the real source of the issue for Disney. 
That's a culture problem. And anyone who has ever worked for a big company knows that changing company culture is extremely difficult, if not impossible. Another big symptom of this culture was that fight in Florida over the parents' rights and education bill, or don't say gay bill, depending on where you get your news. You might recall that then-CEO Bob Chapek actually did not want to get involved. He was bullied by his own employees who threatened a protest if he didn't take a public stance. The culture in this company is such that a majority of employees agreed against the bill and such that the employees felt they could protest their own company and make them take a stance on it. That requires a large number of employees with some strong feelings, and those won't go away just because Bob Iger said to investors, hey, we're going to tone down the social commentary. They feel how they feel, and it's going to bleed into the projects. This attitude is obviously entrenched in the company, and there is no real way to root it out. You can't legally fire your employees for sexual preference or political belief, and I'm very glad that protection is in place. I mean, imagine the hell your workplace would be if every new president or CEO could issue some kind of ideological litmus test and fire you for it. Nevertheless, it leaves Disney with a large group of employees who are happy to continue the work that is driving their customers away and no way to get rid of them. Change is going to have to start at the top and management is going to have to go at these new projects with a machete to root out any semblance of social politics and restore the public image of Disney to the family-friendly picture of the past. They will get public scorn for this, but they will need to decide which audience is larger and therefore more important. The smaller group of liberal couples and Twitter users who generally do not have children, but they have more free income, or the much larger group of families who want simple family content and who will have more children that will be a future generation of customers. I don't have an MBA, so what do I know? But the choice seems pretty clear, and I think the current fiscal environment of the company proves me right. Let me know your thoughts on Disney's current situation and what you think they could do to turn things around. I appreciate you watching, and I'll see you next time.